I'm Dr. Pamela Ruig, Extension Milk Quality Veterinarian with the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And today we're continuing with our series focusing on mastitis pathogens. This week in part four, we're going to be discussing a very important pathogen, and that is mastitis caused by Klebsiella. Klebsiella is a very important organism in the world of mastitis control. It's the second most common gram-negative mastitis pathogen, and it is a frequent cause of clinical mastitis in many dairy herds. In fact, in a recent study that we conducted on 52 large Wisconsin dairy herds, Klebsiella accounted for about 7 to 10 percent of all the cases of clinical mastitis occurring in these herds. It was second only to E. coli as for among gram-negative mastitis pathogens, and it was the fourth most common overall pathogen. When we deal with Klebsiella, there's a couple of different bacterial species which can cause mastitis. The most common is Klebsiella oxytosa, and the second most common is usually Klebsiella pneumoniae. Now, both of these organisms cause the same symptoms in cattle, and both of them are easily destroyed by pasteurization of milk. So there's no concern uh, relative to human food safety if you're drinking pasteurized milk. When we look to trying to determine if Klebsiella is the cause of mastitis, we have to remember that we can't diagnose that Klebsiella is causing the, the disease just by looking at the symptoms of the cow. In order to reach a diagnosis, we must aseptically collect a milk sample from the affected quarter and submit that milk sample to a laboratory. In the laboratory, Klebsiella is diagnosed in that it's a gram-negative organism. It's of the coliform family, just like E. coli is, and it's pretty easy to diagnose based on its appearance when it grows on McConkie agar. Another thing about diagnosis of Klebsiella mastitis is many people on the farm will erroneously assume that all cases of mastitis caused by this organism cause very severe symptoms where the cow is really sick. But in reality, only about a third of the cases result in severe symptoms. About a third of the cases, the cow has only abnormal milk, and about a third of the cases, the abnormal milk might be accompanied by slight, slight swelling in the quarter of the cow. So it's pretty similar to E. coli. And the reason the symptoms are similar to E. coli is the severe symptoms are caused by the same mechanism. If you remember back to E. coli, and this applies to all of the coliform organisms that cause mastitis, the, the severity of the symptoms are caused by the endotoxin portion of the gram-negative cell wall. So an infection occurs, the cow's immune system identifies that there's an infection, sends white blood cells and other immune mediators to the point of the infection to destroy it, and in the process of killing the bacteria, these endotoxin in the cell wall are released. If there's enough bacteria present in the, um, in the affected gland, then in about a third of those cases, we end up with sick cows. Same mechanism and same degree of symptoms that you'd see with E. coli. Now I've talked a bit about how the symptoms are similar to E. coli, but in reality, Klebsiella acts entirely differently when it infects the mammary gland as compared to E. coli. Now Klebsiella is often a persistent infection. In other words, when you see the clinical case in a cow, in most instances, that clinical case is kind of the end stage of a long-term persistent subclinical infection. The reason that we see these long-term persistent subclinical infections is that Klebsiella has virulence characteristics that allow the bacteria to deeply invade into the secretory tissue of the udder. So it can sort of evade the strong host immune response, set up this subclinical phase which can last for a considerable period of time. In fact, only about 50% of Klebsiella infections will stay in a subclinical state less than about 30 days, and about 30% of them will remain subclinical for more than 100 days. Now, because it can set up these long-term subclinical infections, that makes this organism a little bit more tricky to control as compared to its partner, E. coli. The reason it's more difficult to control is um, these long-term subclinical infections often aren't recognized, and because the cow is infected subclinically, she can shed those bacteria in the milk, 
and thus this pathogen, which has an environmental source, can also be spread through infected milk in a contagious fashion at milking time. Another interesting and unique thing about Klebsiella as compared to some of the other mastitis pathogens is that these virulence characteristics that allow the Klebsiella organism to deeply penetrate into the secretory tissue also result in destruction of some of those milk secreting cells. And because those milk secreting cells are destroyed, Klebsiella has a very long term effect on milk production. If you look at the point of infection and then the development of the clinical disease, and if you can trace this in these cows that have Klebsiella infection, often you'll see that the milk production plummets greatly. What is unusual about Klebsiella then is that milk production often never recovers to a normal level in that cow. It is very common to see a 10 pound or 11 pound reduction in daily milk yield that persists across the rest of the lactation in these cows that have developed these infections. And the result of that is often that many cows that are affected with clinical mastitis caused by Klebsiella end up leaving the herd because they're simply not productive. Now because Klebsiella can have such a profound impact on milk yield, the most important part of controlling it is on identifying sources and preventing the initial infection. Klebsiella has lots of sources on the dairy farm. It's shed in the feces of about 70% of cows. And in fact, some research has shown that cows that are fed higher concentrate diets tend to shed a little bit more of them. So especially in our high producing herds, many of the cows in the herd may actually be shedding this organism in their feces. It can also be found in bedding and especially in wood byproducts. And it is also, there's very good research that has shown that this organism is often found on dirty udders. Work done out in New York um, went out and they did udder hygiene scoring on cattle and then they took swabs of the udders. What they found was pretty interesting. When udders were clean, meaning they had an udder hygiene score of one, only about 10% of those udders uh, yielded Klebsiella from the, the udder skin swabs. In contrast, when udders were dirty, meaning they were scored uh, threes or fours, 55% of those udders were colonized with Klebsiella. So clearly looking at hygiene of the dairy cows is an important way to work on controlling this organism. Now those are some of the environmental sources of the organism, but remember this organism establishes long-term chronic persistent subclinical infections and that means it can be shed in the milk of these subclinically infected cows and transmitted potentially from cow to cow at milking time. So when we look at understanding how to prevent and control inf uh, mastitis infections caused by Klebsiella, what we have to focus on is both environmental sources and potentially contagious transmission. So overall, the primary objective, the critical control point, is to reduce the Tdan exposure to potential sources of the Klebsiella bacteria. Practical ways that we can do that on the dairy farm mean we have to really critically look at the types and the usage of bedding on the farm. We have to work on improving our hygiene. And we really recommend the use of the J5 core antigen vaccine in cattle because it will work just as well to reduce the severity and limit infections with Klebsiella as it does to limit infections with E. coli. We also want to um, remember that this organism can be spread in a contagious fashion. So we need to identify the cows that have subclinical infections caused by Klebsiella so that we can reduce the potential for transmission among cows. That means we have to have a culturing program going on on our farm looking to identify cows early. In order also to limit uh, transmission in a contagious fashion, we must always have excellent milking procedures that include effective implementation of pre and post milking teat disinfection. And then finally, after we do identify cows that have chronic subclinical infections caused by uh, Klebsiella, we want to think about segregating those cows, milking them last, and of course, culling those cows when it's necessary to protect the health of their herd mates. Now sometimes the cows do develop clinical mastitis and we're faced with the question of how to treat them. 
Now remember about one-third of the cases are mild and one-third of the cases are moderate, meaning all we have are at the maximum are abnormal milk and maybe a swollen quarter. On those cases we have some options before we start treatment. And the first thing we want to do is look at the history of the cow. We want to make sure we have a culture result that indicates that the case is Klebsiella. It's also pretty important to look at the history of the somatic cell count of that cow and determine has that case been preceded by one or more months where the cell count exceeds 200,000 cells per ml. If the answer to those questions is yes or if we have a case that's been preceded by previous cases of clinical mastitis, then we can really recognize we've had a fairly long-term infection with an invasive pathogen and antimicrobial treatment is definitely needed. Now the difficulty at this point comes in that in the United States there are no intramammary products that are specifically labeled for treatment of Klebsiella infections. That means that when we use an intramammary treatment to treat a Klebsiella infection, that's an extra label usage of that product and it must be supervised by your veterinarian. Now, what are our options for intramammary treatment? Well, this is a gram-negative bacteria, and that means that many of the intramammary compounds that we have available in the U.S. do not have the ability to bind with and destroy these particular organisms. In fact, what we'd like to recommend is the use of a third-generation cephalosporin, like the Spectrumass product. And there is some limited amount of data that suggests that on some farms, the use of intramammary spectrum mass for an extended duration, about a five-day treatment, may improve the bacteriologic cure rate of some cows infected with Klebsiella. Now, while that data is fairly preliminary, it's important for me to, rec uh, to, to comment that while bacteriological cure were improved, the current data didn't show an impact on milk yield nor an impact on somatic cell count. So Spectromast is just about our only option right now, but we sure do need some more research to determine the best treatment for cows with clinical cases. Now about a third of the cows that um, develop mastitis caused by Klebsiella may actually go on to develop severe mastitis or grade three mastitis where they have systemic signs. Those signs may include um, fever, uh, uh, off feed, the cow may um, drastically decrease in milk production, or she may actually be in shock and be recumbent and close to death. In all of these instances, when a cow has systemic signs of mastitis, we need to make sure that these cows receive supportive therapies. They need to have fluids to support their cardiovascular system, they need anti-inflammatories, and they need systemic antimicrobial therapy to make sure that the bacteremia don't spread throughout the body through the bloodstream. Uh, in general, uh, these are the type of cases that a veterinarian should be involved in a specific treatment protocol under that veterinarian supervision should be developed. Cows develop mastitis caused by Klebsiella when their teats are exposed to Klebsiella that are found in their surroundings in places like moisture, mud, manure, or when their teats are exposed to milk that originated from the udder of one of their herd mates who has a chronic subclinical infection. Klebsiella is different from other gram-negative, many of the other gram-negative organisms in that these Klebsiella infections may persist for a long period, result in increased somatic cell count, and often these Klebsiella infections result in uh, very significant reductions in milk yield. When we look at um, dealing with Klebsiella, we have to remember that after the cow develops a clinical case, there's no approved antibiotic treatments. Uh, but we do usually recommend intramammary therapy under the supervision of your veterinarian using a third generation cephalosporin such as Spectrumast. And finally, what we really need to do is prevent the infections. And control of uh, Klebsiella mastitis is based on keeping cows clean, dry, and separated from the chronically affected cows.